This morning, the title of my message is The Roadmap to Maturity. The Roadmap to Maturity. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, and we're going to go through to, uh, to the next chapter, uh, into uh, chapter 3, verse 1. So starting at verse 14, it says, But the, car, uh, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he now, uh, neither can he know them, because they are uh, spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges of all things, uh, yet he himself is judged of no man. For he, sorry, excuse me, for who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. Verse 1, chapter 3. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto uh, carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I, I ask that you would fill me with your spirit this morning. God, that you would uh, speak through me, that you would give me uh, clarity of thought and clarity of speech, that those things that uh, need to be heard would be heard. And Lord, that you would use my voice, Lord, uh, to convey your truth. And Lord, that you would give us ears to hear, Lord, your word, that the seed of your word would fall upon fertile soil upon our hearts. God, that we would grow in the grace and the knowledge of you, in Jesus' name, amen. As I said, the title of this morning's message is The Roadmap to Maturity. We are all the time categorizing people. We label them, you know, based on their economic you know, position or their careers or, or what they look like, what they say, however they are, right? The Bible also categorizes people too. It groups, uh, it groups people into three basic categories, natural, spiritual, and carnal. Everyone in this building today falls into one of these three categories. You are in one of these three. The primary purpose of the Bible is, uh, is that God desires to reveal himself to fallen men so that he might enter into a relationship with them. That's what God wants us to do. He wrote the Bible so that way we could become saved, that way we could follow him, right? His desire, uh, his desire is that man will come to know him through Jesus Christ, and then that after, uh, after they are saved, that they will grow up in him into, a, uh, into mature Christians. But sadly enough, there are so many Christians nowadays that are still baby Christians. There, are, there have been people that have been going to church for years and still haven't got off the spiritual milk. They haven't got, onto the, they haven't got into the meat of God's word yet because, uh, because of where they're at. Now, as I said, the Bible offers a plan for, uh, for growing into maturity. However you, mu- uh, 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 however, you must know where you are before you can ever hope to go any farther. My desire, obviously, this morning is that you will figure out which, which category you're in and you would want to be better in that. You would want to be a better believer in Christ. So we've been going over the, you know, the past month and a half or so, we've been going through basic Bible doctrines. So if you go on to like YouTube or on, on to Facebook, YouTube is, is categorized in different ways, but we've been going through basic Bible doctrines. Oftentimes people, as they've gone to church for years and years, these are things that are not preached anymore because they figure, well, everybody knows this. But how many, uh, how many people know that sometimes you need to go over things? That you need to, you know, to keep going over things because we need to understand certain things, right? The first man that I want to go over, and when I say man, is mankind, you know, the spiritual man. This applies to men, both men and women. This is not just a, um, but the Bible, you know, uh, you know, calls them, you know, uh, natural man. So the first one is the natural man. This is the person that lives naturally. Makes sense, right? They live, uh, they live naturally. Verse 14 says this. It says, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can, uh, can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So we see this in a few, cha- uh, a few verses that, for number, uh, number one, in the natural man, he is depraved. He is depraved. What does that mean? Well, Psalm 58, uh, 58 3 says, The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they, uh, they be born, speaking lies. Everybody is born into this category. Everybody is born. When you are born, you are born a natural man. You you are born, uh, you know, in the natural sense, in that everyone has a bend towards sinning. 
Now, a baby, you know, obviously, obviously we know that, you know, babies and, and children to a certain age are, um, they are innocent. Meaning that if a child, you know, were to die at a young age, if they don't understand, you know, sin, they don't understand right from wrong, they don't understand those things, then what? They are born innocent, and the Bible says that they go to heaven if they were to die, okay? And so we understand that, but when they, you know, when they get to a certain uh, age and they begin to understand those things, the Bible says, you know, that now that they've understood that they go on to be that natural man or that natural person that is as it says here, that they, go, that they go astray. And it says that in John 8, 44, the first part of that, it says, ye are of your father, ye are, ye are of your father the devil, and the, the lusts of your father ye will do. In other words, saying that, you know what, you're going to do whatever feels good. That person is going to do, the natural person is going to do whatever feels good to them. What everybody, somebody tells them, they're not really controlled by anything. They are able to. They are do. Uh, they are going to do whatever the world tells them to do, wherever Satan tells them that he wants them to do. The natural man is prone to sin. Like I said, there is a bend in his nature towards evil. It's like this: if you have electricity and you have water, which way does electricity go? It takes the path of what least resistance. It's going to go uh, automatically. That's how they are. The natural person is prone to sin. That's what they're going to do. That's what they're bent towards doing. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 10 through 12, says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understands. Uh, understands. There is none that seeks after God. They are all gone out of, the, uh, out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. So we see in this one, obviously, they're depraved. That's what they have. That's where they go. The next, part, uh, the next um, attribute of the natural man is that he is directed. He is directed. We see this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse, uh, verses 1 through 3. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And it says, And, uh, and you, uh, you have he quickened, who are dead in trespasses and sins, Wherein, in time past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, which, that is Satan, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in uh, times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others." And so we see that the natural man, the, their life is out of their hands. Oftentimes you talk to somebody that is not saved, what do they say? They say, I feel like my, my life is chaotic. I feel like everything is just going all, all around me. Why? Because you know what? There's no restraint in their life. There's nothing there. It's out of their hands. They're doing whatever the devil would have them to do, and the devil wants them to be chaotic. They want their, they want their life to be a disaster. The, the Bible says that he wants to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what he wants. You know, they are under the control of Satan, and in a sense, they are like a mindless uh, a puppet that carries out every whim of the flesh and, uh, and desire that they have, because the devil does not want them to get saved. The devil wants them to stay as far away possible, uh, you know, to the Lord Jesus Christ as possible. The latter part of John, it says this about, you know, about Satan. Um, the latter part of John eight forty four says this. It says, he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. And so this is the reason why, like nowadays, you see all over the place. Not just, you know, you see it on TV, you see wherever you go. The, those that are not saved, the, the tr uh, truth to them is objective. Or sorry, subjective. That it can change whenever it wants to. They say, you know what, that's the truth for you, but that's not true for me. That's why oftentimes when somebody, you know, will say, you know what, I'm a Christian, they'll go over and they'll try and talk to them about getting saved and everything else. They say, well, that's good that it worked for you, but it doesn't work for me. The Bible is absolute truth. Jesus Christ is the truth, no matter what. But they want you to say, well, you know, I'm glad that that works for you. You know, the, the, the thing is, is that with religions out there, every single one of them, takes an aspect or a, a portion of a truth of God's words from the Bible and twists it. Every single one of them will start off with a little shred of truth, 
We learned that with, with, we just had a seminar on Jehovah's Witnesses and what they believe. They, uh, they will take a shred of truth and twist it. And to where they actually got it now, to where they say that they believe the Bible, but they never read it. That they read the Watchtower magazine. And they say that everything in the Watchtower magazine is true. But then they'll go on and say, well, you know what? No, it's not true. So they're really confused. So you have all these different religions that take a shred of God's word, the Bible, and make it say whatever they wanted to say. Why? Because inherently, we all want to know the truth. But yet, we don't want to know the truth. Because if we know the truth, then all of a sudden, then we have something you know, uh, to stack it up against. We have something to stack it up against and say that's the truth. And then when we find out the truth, then we're like, well, you know, I don't think I really want to know the truth. Because, you know, sometimes the truth hurts. And you know what? It's going to hurt. Sometimes, you know what? The truth, you know, because of the fact that it hurts, it's a good thing. We need to know the truth. We know, you know what? Even if it hurts us. Even if it hurts us. The third attribute of the natural man is that he is in darkness. He is in darkness. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 says this, In whom the God of this world, and again he's talking about Satan, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. In other words, like I said, he's in darkness. He's, their minds are blinded by Satan in this world. We saw this with Nicodemus. Nicodemus in, in John chapter 3 talks about, you know, talks over and over again to Jesus. He, you know, Jesus has begun to explain salvation to him. And he says, you must be born again. And he says, well, how is that possible? And if, that was, if, if he was saved at that point, he would have known. He would have known exactly what he is saying. Even though that he's you know, along with the Pharisees, he's this religious person supposed to know the Bible, but yet doesn't. It's not until later on that he actually understands it, and, he under, and when Jesus is, explains it to him, that he all of a sudden, you know, that he understands what he is saying. The natural man does not see his problem, nor does he understand the things of God. He's not going to. I mean, it says uh, that he, he receives not. He doesn't welcome the things of God. He doesn't receive the things of God. The natural man does not do this. He may appreciate the th- some of the things about church. There are people out there, they're like, church is a good thing. We've met people that I've taught to. I, I mean, there's one in particular that I'm thinking of, but I'm not going to say who they are. They came up and he said, I am grateful for everything that the church does. I am grateful for you going out and doing this and sharing your faith. I am grateful and yet did not even care to go about it. They says, but you know what? I don't believe anything that you say. So they, they care. Uh, they'll say that they appreciate some of the things about the church, about worship, but the spiritual things will be pure foolishness to them. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 says, says this, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish meaning those that are going to hell, foolish, foolishness. But unto, them, uh, unto us, which are saved, it is the power of God. We understand what it means. You go out there, you talk to some people about Jesus Christ, and they're like, man, you're an idiot. You don't know what you're talking about. This is nothing. And, they, it, and sometimes we can get offended by that. They're like, what do you mean? You know, I understand. They don't understand. Why? Because they're the natural man. They are in darkness. They don't understand it. That's why we need to go over and we need to talk to them. This is the unsaved person. He doesn't understand the people of God and and criticizes the things that he doesn't understand because they bother him and he doesn't know why. He ever had somebody say, you know what, I don't like what you're saying, but I don't don't know why I don't like what you're saying. When you're talking to him about the Lord. There's been many a times where I've talked to some some people and they will say that. They'll They'll say, I understand what you're saying, but I don't like it. They really don't understand it because if they did, they would understand it and want to get saved, right? And when I say, uh, say, uh, say the word saved, what I'm saying is that they are saved from hell. They are saved from Satan. When a person gets saved, that's what happens. The Bible says that they go, they, you know, they leave darkness, which is you know, hell, Satan, and all that stuff, and to come into his marvelous light, which is Jesus Christ, heaven, and those things. It's the polar opposite. Heaven you know, and Jesus are the polar opposite to hell and Satan. So that's when, I, you know, when I say the word saved, I don't want you to sit there and go, well, saved from what? I'm not dying or anything else. 
you are, uh, if you're not saved, you are dying and you're on, you're on your way to hell. That's what the Bible you know, teaches us and shows us. It's for, uh, for them, for the, the one that's in darkness, it is often like, it's like a person, like a, a deaf person criticizing music. Or is it like a, a blind man ri- ridiculing art? How would a blind man, you know, be able to ridicule art if they can't see it, right? It's like this one man, it's like, uh, it's like the man described, you know, the blind man described in John chapter 9, verse 25, that says this. It says, he answered and said, what, uh, and he's speaking, you know, they're asking him about Jesus Christ, about, you know, whether or not this man, you know, Jesus was a sinner or not, and, and, and this guy, this is all he says. He says, he answered and said, whether he be a sinner or not, I know not. One thing I know that whereas I was blind, now I see. All of us in this room, uh, all of us in this room that are saved and on their way to heaven would understand that statement, that you were blind, but now you see. All those things, you, some of you say, well, I don't really understand that because I got saved at a uh, very early age. Well, praise God that you, you understand it at a very early age, that you got saved at an early age because you didn't need to learn about that. Me, I, uh, I didn't get saved until I was nearly 21. So I understand what he was saying. The fact is, is that for me, when I got saved, it seemed like things were so much different. I'm not saying that you have to have that experience inside of you that all of a sudden says, well, I felt something when I prayed you know, to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Some people do, some people don't. It doesn't change the fact that you're saved, right? If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are saved. Sometimes you feel saved, sometimes you don't. Probably more times than not, you're probably not going to feel saved. But you're not going off of your feelings. You're going off of God's word, which is here, right? Amen. This is what you're going off of. And the Bible says, you know what? That he that hath the Son has life. Amen. And that's what we're going with. The next attribute is, is that he is doomed. The natural man is doomed. Hell is his certain future. Romans 9, oh, sorry, not Romans Psalm 9, verse 17 says, The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Or put it this way, you're born once and you die twice. You say, well, how is that possible? Because of the fact that you die not only physically, but you die spiritually as well. And when you die spiritually, you're, uh, you know, you're thrown into hell. And the Bible says later on that the hell is going to be cast into the lake of fire forever and ever. The next, attribute, uh, the next attribute, as I kind of talked about a little bit, is of the natural man is that he is dead. While he lives and breathes, the natural man is in a perpetual state of death. It's like a car with no battery. It has no use, right? That, that natural man, uh, they, uh, they are on their way you know, to hell, the, the, uh, everything about them. See, here's the thing for the believer. Whereas this body will die, our spirit never will. This body will go into a grave, but this spirit will live forever. If you, are, if you are a natural man, not only does your body go in the grave, but your spirit is cast down into hell and is you know, in that forever torment. That's, that's the difference in this one. The next man I want to talk about is the spiritual man. This person lives supernaturally. Let's look at verses 15 through 16. It says this. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. For those that are newly saved and everything else, you understand this because all of a sudden you begin to think differently. You begin to, you know, realize things. You're going, you know what, why is it that now that I'm, you know, that I feel like something's telling me not to do this? Because this is what happened. You have the Spirit of God living inside of you. You have the mind of Christ that now, that now is speaking to you. And you can choose to ignore it or you can choose to follow it. But the thing is, is that you want to follow that, that voice that says, don't do this. Or go do this. You want to follow what the Spirit of God is saying. There is a vast difference between the natural man and the spiritual man. A vast difference. The spiritual man has been born twice. As I talked about earlier about being born again. You are not only born, obviously, you know, from your mom, but you are also born again in your spirit. Your spirit is made alive. He is, uh, he is in a uh, living, growing, vibrant personal relationship with Jesus Christ. As a result, God has, given, uh, God has given the capacity 
to live differently. You don't have to live the same way that you were living. You don't have to. Jesus Christ you know, wants you to live differently. Why? Because were you happy with your life before you were saved? Don't be like the children of Israel you know, when, they got out, you know, out of, uh, when they got out of Egypt and all of a sudden go, man, it was so much better back in bondage. I mean, back in Egypt. It was so much better, you know, uh, you know, you know, being a slave and doing all the things that they wanted us to do. You know, I would rather go there and be a slave than to go live in the freedom that I have in Christ. Don't look back and say, you know what, life was so much better because it wasn't. You know it wasn't. Don't let Satan lie to you and tell you that it was better when it wasn't. Because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the spiritual man is able to comprehend the spiritual things of God and, tell, uh, and it tells in the way that he lives. It tells in the way he lives. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter tw- uh, 2, verse 12 through 13. So a couple of verses up. It says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak not in the words which, man te- uh, which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, uh, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. We are able to understand those things. Now, let me tell you this. If you read the Bible and you don't understand a portion of Scripture, that does not mean that you're not saved. That means that God hasn't, sh- uh, hasn't, given, hasn't given you the explanation to that yet. Don't get hung up on the things that you don't understand in the Bible. Read and, to, uh, you know, read, uh, you know, read and understand those things that you do understand. I'm not saying like forget you know, reading those verses ever. Keep reading them. God is going to give you that. That's the reason why we say, you know what, I can read the Bible a thousand times, and it's, and it's that one thousand one time that all of a sudden I'm like, why did that, I'd never see that verse before, Right? So don't focus on the fact of the things that you don't understand. Focus on those things that you do understand. Okay? I don't want to try to get, you know, because sometimes people get so hung up on the things that they don't understand that they never go on and they just go, you know, I'm going to stay in this baby state because I don't understand it. And you're like throwing a temper tantrum. I don't understand it. I don't want it. And you just stay in that spot. Okay? Go with those things that you do understand. The first attribute of the spiritual man is this, that he lives by the Spirit. He lives by the Spirit. The spiritual man lives his life governed by the rule of the Holy Spirit in his heart. He allows God to rule and reign in his life. He gets into the Word and allows it to transform his life, and he is different because of it. If we go to God's Word saying, you know what, I don't really, I don't, I have to do this, I whatever, you're never really going to understand it. But you say, you know what, God, I, I guide me. I, I, I want to be changed. I want to be, look more like you. I want to be more like you. And when we say look more like you is the fact that, that, that when we go down the street, that people say, man, I tell you, they look different. I remember how they were, but now, man, they look different. There's something about them. Like they're the same person, but there's something different about them. You know, you know what I'm saying? And that's the thing is that, well, we need to understand that they live by the Spirit they say, you know what? I want to be transformed by. It. Now, is this going to be an easy thing? No. Do you know why it's, going to, it's not going to be an easy thing? Is because Satan is going to send people to try and get you to do the things that you used to do. Because he doesn't want you to be the spiritual man. Satan doesn't want you to be the spiritual man. He doesn't want you to be growing. He wants to send all kinds of people to try and distract you and get you off of what God has for you. But we are to get into God's word and we are allowed to transform us and to be different. Because when we do that, it's like, you know, a Psalm 119 verse, uh, verse 105 that says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That when we say, you know, we get into God's word, we begin to read it, we begin to look at it and say, man, this is awesome. This is amazing. I re- you know, I'll tell you this. I remember when I first got saved. I could not get away from God's word. I, I just wanted to stay in there and keep on going and keep on going. But I had, a, I had a job, so I had to go to work. But I just wanted to stay in there. And it's only later on that you start to meet, you know, you, you know those you know, mature believers. I almost feel like, I'll put it this way, mature believers will come out to you and say, you know what, you don't have to be you know, that, 
You really don't have to get in God's word that way. You really don't have to do that. I mean, do you really have to go out and knock door to door to see people? No, you don't really have to. You're still saved. And that's what Satan will do. Satan will do everything possible. He will send different people. Why? Because we're going to get into the one, per, uh, the one person you say, well, pastor, a mature Christian would do that? Well, the Bible refers to him as a carnal Christian. A carnal Christian. We'll get to them here in a, in a moment. Do not listen to that person that tries to get you to read or to do less of what God wants you to do. Continue. There's people you know, that I've met that said, you know, I, I just want to have a fire inside of me. I want to I do these things. I want to whatever. Get in God's word. Amen. If the Bible says that his word is a lamp unto my feet, that's not like, like that. That, you know, that it was being spoken of. It's a, literally like, I, like a candle, a fire. If you want that, it says your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. If you want to be able to see the way that God sees, if you want to be able to do the things that God would have you to do, get into his word. Don't listen to the naysayers. Don't listen to those you know, that would have you say, you know what, come down to my level. No, you say, you know what? Oh, you don't, you don't like the fact that, you know, that I'm reading God's word? You know what? Come up to my level, and you bring them up. You go the other way with them. John 16, verse 13 says this, How be it, when he, uh, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he uh, shall uh, not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that, uh, that shall he speak, and he will uh, show you things to come. In other words, when you read God's word, as I said earlier, say, Lord, guide me into all truth. Why? Because that's what it says that the Spirit of God is going to do, is guide you into all truth. We have to, we have to you know, ask the, the Lord to guide us into all truth, to show us things, because you know what? We need to know what God's word says. Because sometimes people you know, come up and they say, well, Pastor, I'm not, not quite understanding this. I don't whatever. And I'm not going to come up to say, uh, you know, somebody that says, hey, Pastor, I'm not understanding, be like, well, you know what, go read God's word again, and you didn't do it. No, I'll try to explain them, but here's the thing, is that if we ask the Holy Spirit to guide us, he's going to do it. He's going to do it. Galatians 5, 16 says, This then I say, uh, this I say then, walk in the Spirit, and uh, ye shall not fulfill the lust of the, flesh, of the flesh. If you are reading God's word, you're in God's word, you know God's word, you're, you're memorizing God's word, you're doing the things that God's word asks you, the Bible says what? That you are not going to fulfill the desires of the flesh. You're not going to fulfill those. The next attribute of the spiritual man is this. He learns from the spirit. The spiritual man is able to receive the truths of the word. He is able to grasp spiritual things. He can understand the, God, uh, the Bible. He uh, can enjoy the presence of, of the Lord. God's truth are not foolishness, but they are food to him. This is the reason why Jesus says, you know what, that man, can, uh, you know, man can't live by bread alone, but from every word that proceeds from the mouth of God or from the word of God, right? Job chapter 23, verse 12 says this. It says, neither have, oh, sorry, no, that's not it. Oh, yes, it is, sorry. Job chapter 23, verse 12 says, neither have I gone back from the, uh, from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more uh, more than my necessary, uh, necessary food. The word of God is food for our soul. The only way, that's the only way that we can grow is by feeding on God's word. That's, uh, that is the only way, uh, that is the only way that we learn from him. The last attribute of the, of the spiritual man is that he is liberated by the spirit. He is liberated. He has freedom by the spirit. The spiritual man is liberated from the bondage, uh, from, uh, from the bondage to, the, uh, to the flesh, the world, and the devil because he is able to discern the will of God by judging or examining everything by the word of truth. The Bible is going to be able to tell you those things. You're going to be able to judge and to be able to examine those things and say, you know what, that's not of God. This is of God. That's not of God. You're going to be able to understand those things. When somebody comes up to you and gives you some sort of inspirational quote, you can say, you know what, that's, that's not even close to what the Bible, uh, Bible's truth is. I'm not saying that every single person in this room has to, every time that they talk to somebody, has to speak a scripture to them. That would get you know, kind of weird you know, after a while. But I'm saying the thing is that you could speak the truth to somebody without um, you know, quoting verbatim what the Bible says, right? 
Like, I can sit there and, you know, I don't have to go up to, you know, you know, I'll just use my wife for an example. I don't have to go up to my wife and say, well, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, that no one comes to the Father except by him. She may look at me and go, what? But I can come up to her and say, well, you know that, you know, Jesus Christ, he is, the, you know, he is the way. He gives us all, you know, all truth. And he, all, he's the only, you know, by him is the only way we can get to heaven. Did I, same contents, you know, they're right. Same contents, you know, there, because there's an awful lot of, you know, things, that, you know, I don't have a Facebook, but the church does have a Facebook, and I see all these inspirational quotes. I don't know if they're from you or from other people. I have no idea. But I see these inspirational quotes, and I'm like, that, the Bible doesn't even say that. Why, why, are, why are you sharing this to your page? You know, it's a nice, snazzy little thing to say. It's a, it's a cool thing, you know, to, to say something, but it, it has nothing to do with God's Word. And then some people will try to say, well, you know what, that's Facebook. I mean, I read the Bible, but why... Out of the overflow of the heart or out of the overflow of, you know, the heart, the finger clicks. Whatever, you know, is inside of you is going to come out no matter what. So why put, why put a non-truth on, like, your Facebook, Twitter, whatever you got nowadays? You know, there's so many different things out there, you know, uh, different social medias and everything else. So the fact that, you know, uh, so by us being able to judge, by, the, by a spiritual per, uh, man being able to be able to judge everything and examine everything according uh, to the word of God, therefore he is not e- uh, easily squeezed into the world's mold, uh, mold. Or as Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says, and be not, be, uh, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's what God wants. He wants you to, uh, to be conformed into him, uh, His image. The spiritual man is able to look at things through a different set of lenses. He literally, he literally possesses the mind of Christ in his daily life. Isn't that what the Word of God says? That we have the mind of Christ. If you are saved, you have the mind of Christ. You have the... Uh, the thing, which is a good thing to know, which is a good thing to have, is that we have the mind of Christ. You know why? Because we live in a crazy, messed up world. Do we not? We live in a crazy, mixed up, out of control world. And it's good to know that we have the mind of Christ. That's why the Bible also says, you know, to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. Because we can sit there and we can hear stuff that we think that sounds like it, like, you know, on Facebook, you know, things that we think that sounds like God's word, sounds like some sort of truth, but it's far from it. By the way, whatever is going on in, in people's lives does not mean that that's truth. It's truth of that situation, but that does not mean that you say, you know what, well, that's the Bible. It's not absolute truth. Just because you have something going on in your life does not mean that, you know what, that's truth. At most, you can get out of it, it's a messed up truth, probably. If there's some bad situation happening, it's probably a messed up truth. Yes, is there a truth somewhere in that? Yes. But oftentimes, people you know, always focus on their truth as opposed to what actually happened in that situation, right? Because if somebody does something bad, what do they do? They tell their version of the truth, which is skewed. Or we have a bias towards things. The, spirit, uh, the spiritual man is literally filled with the Spirit of God. God controls his mind, his heart, his hands, his feet, his tongue, his flesh. Everything is yielded to the control of the Spirit of the Lord. There is nothing held back from the Lord. God doesn't, you know, when God saves you, he gives you everything. He doesn't hold things back just because, well, you know what, you got to, you know. This is not like a video game. This is not a video game where you go up there and be like, oh, well, I, I got to do another 12 level, uh, you know, levels before I can get this power, or I can do this one, or do that one, or do whatever. No. God gives you everything when you get saved. Right? Some of you are not really sure about that, I don't think. God gives you everything. It's whether or not you choose to give it back or give the, the devil a place to where he takes that back. That's the problem right there. Don't, the Bible says, neither give place to the devil. Resist the devil and he will flee. When you realize that Satan's trying to get something, you know what? 
Stand, you know, as the Bible says, stand your ground. Stand firm. Because you know what? He can't have anything unless you give it to him. Now here's the thing with the spiritual man. Not many achieve this level of Christianity. But it should be the goal for every sincere Christian. Why do I say that? There are a lot of people that never achieve this goal. How could I say that? Because if, if they did, the world would be so much different. The world would be so much different. But I say this, it should be our goal. It should be everyone's goal, to, uh, every, every sincere Christian, to, uh, to be that person to be the spiritual man, to get into God's word, to study God's word, to meditate upon God's word, to live God's word, to ask God's word, to, you know, God to change them and transform them, that they would be more like Jesus Christ. Amen? That's, uh, that should be our desire. So are you there yet? The last one I want to talk about is the carnal man. The carnal man. This person is saved, but they live after the flesh. They live unnaturally. Verse 1 of chapter 3 in 1 Corinthians says this, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as spiritual, but as carnal, even as babes in Christ. This type of person is saved, yet mostly unchanged. They got saved, but they, you know what? They didn't go any further. They just kind of decided to sit there and stagnate. This person, uh, this person has, never, uh, has never grown in the Lord. He is, he is always being defeated by the flesh, by the world, and by Satan. It is possible to be a Christian and to be very carnal. The first attribute of the carnal man is this, that he is defeated. There are three ways that he is defeated. Three areas that he has defeated. And it, and it will continually show up until they decide to get right and say, you know what, I want to go on to be that spiritual man. I want to grow in the, uh, grow in the Lord uh, continually. Number one is this. He uh, can't walk spiritually. He can't walk spiritually. Constantly losing the battle to the flesh, the world, and to the devil. No matter what, it's like he just gives in no matter what. Like, he, know, uh, he got saved, but yet he's just like, you know what? I can't do it. He just instantly gives up. Number two is this. He can't war spiritually. He can't war spiritually. He, is able, he isn't able to dress up in the whole armor of God as, as is, as is describe it, uh, described in Ephesians chapter 6. And if you don't know what the spiritual armor of God is or the whole armor of God is, we've been going through it on Wednesday night. So if you want to catch up, it is on YouTube as well. It is also on Facebook you know, thus far of where we're at. Back to, my, back to my sermon and away from my little plug for coming on Wednesday nights. Some of the pieces are missing from this person, and the ones he does have, he doesn't know how to use. He can't fight evil, and he's always defeated. He's always beaten. This is the person that says, you know what, no matter what, I can't seem to, I can't seem to get you know, past this point. I can't seem to do this. I can't. I, I just can't. And then you begin to ask them, are you reading God's word? Are you praying? Are you, are you talking to people about the Lord? Are you living the Christian life? Are you, when you're reading God's word, are you saying, you know what, God transform me and change me? Or do you only you know, pick up God's word and maybe get a verse in, and then you're like, I'm good for the next month. I'm not trying to like, bash you or anything else. I'm just stating what happens. Because I know there are days where you know, people will come home, and, they will, you know, and, and they're exhausted. The day has, been, has worn them out, and then they try to go read God's word, and they can't, and they just fall asleep. This is the reason why I was trying not to cough. This is the reason why the Bible talks about reading the, the Bible in the morning or that when you wake up. Because the thing is, the day hasn't happened yet. The day hasn't messed you up yet. The day hasn't got you tired yet. The day hasn't got you exhausted. But when you wake up, you, 
you're ready to go. Go grab a cup of coffee if you need to, green tea if your brother does, and go read God's word. I, know, I say that because I know that Doug and Rose every morning get up and they read God's word. And they're ready for the day. Sometimes the day's not ready for them. No. But that's the reason why we should read God's word. And I, I'm pointing my you know, finger because there's days where I, I get up, I read God's word as soon as I get up. Other days, you know, I'm like, you know what? I got to do this, I got to do this, I got to do this. And I get home and I'll, I'll, I'll read as much as I, I mean, I, can I just be honest? There are times where I'm reading God's word at night and I get woken up. Not because of the fact that the spirit of God is waking me up or unless the spirit of God is poking my phone and my phone hits me in the face. Because I'm, I'm out sleeping. Because I've had a long day and, you know, and that's the way it is. That's why it's better to get up in the morning and read God's word. Nobody else has ever had, you know, had yourself like reading God's word off your phone and then all of a sudden that miraculously that phone just falls down and hits you in the face? Am I the only one? I mean, I remember one time I was talking to someone and I said, you know what, I said, I'm praying right before I go to bed and I said, I feel horrible. And they said, well, why? I said, because all of a sudden, you know, I, I just, I, I fell asleep. I said, I was kneeling by my bedside and I said, I was just, I was out for an hour. And they said, well, you know, you could look at it one of two ways. You could beat yourself up about it or, the, you know, it's probably the best way you can go to sleep because you were talking to Jesus before you fell asleep. That's no excuse, by the way. Read God's word when you first wake up. When, you, when you're full of energy, when you're ready to go, even if you have a busy day, you know what? Come on, say, I'm going to read a chapter. I'm going to read a few verses. I'm going to do something because you've got you to have some food in the morning, right? The Bible is spiritual food. We need that food for all, uh, uh, throughout the day. But I encourage you, you know, if you need to, wake up a little bit earlier and go to bed earlier. Because I know there are some night owls in here. And they say, I, I can't do it because I fall asleep and everything else. You, you know what? Go to bed earlier, then you'll wake up earlier, and then everything's, you're like, but pastor, I've been doing that for 50, 60, you know what? There's no time like the present, you know, present to change, all right? And uh, the third attribute of being defeated as the carnal man is this. He can't work spiritually. I said he can't walk spiritually, he can't war spiritually, and he can't work spiritually. This type of person is uh, not, uh, not much use to the kingdom of God. The carnal Christian does not win souls. They don't support their church financially or with their presence. I'm not talking about a little uh, gift. I'm talking about they show up every so often to church. I'm talking about that presence, your presence, you physically being here. People say, well, I don't need to go to church to be saved. That's true. You don't. But you need to go to church in order to grow. And if you want to grow, you come to church. If you want to grow, you read God's word. If you want to grow, you pray. If you want to grow, I mean, these are all, you know, things. If you want to do this, uh, uh, if you want to be that spiritual man, these are things that you do. You say, well, pastor, you're just trying to get, you know, you're just trying to get a bigger offering. We already took the offering. I say it because the word of God says, you know, for us to do those things, to support the local church. This person also doesn't teach, and it uh, never become, uh, and they never become actively involved in the church. You'll see them here every so often. They just kind of come in, you know, here and there. You say, "Hey, how you been doing?" And then you won't see them again for a month or two. But the next attribute, uh, you know, of the eternal Christian is this: is that he is dependent. He is dependent. Look at First Corinthians chapter three, verse two. We didn't read that at the beginning, but we're going to read that now. Is this, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto ye, uh, ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. This person must be spoon-fed. They must be given milk all the time. They're spoon-fed. The carnal Christian is totally dependent on others for spiritual nourishment that they receive. He can't uh, teach. He must always be taught. He cannot serve, but he must be served. He cannot glean spiritual truth for himself, but the pastor must spoon feed him when he shows up to church. He is helpless. He is helpless. Spiritually speaking, he is a baby. This person is a baby in Christ. They're the one. 
And I'm going to go on to uh, you know, a couple of those uh, you know, areas as, as well in this, that he is dependent. Oftentimes, like I say, there's a person, you know, this person will come in and they will begin, and when they don't hear something that they like from the pastor, they oftentimes criticize what the pastor has to say. I'm not saying that a, a person you know, can't ask questions. But if you're only asking the questions so you can argue with the pastor, then there's a problem. And I'm not saying the pastor is always right. That's why I tell you to bring the word of God you know, uh, to church. Amen? The, la- uh, the, the last attribute of uh, a carnal Christian is this. He is divisive. He is divisive. Let's look at uh, chapter 3 again of 1 Corinthians. Let's look at verses 3 through 7 that says this. And it describes the carnal Christian. For ye are not, uh, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is, there is among you envying, strife, and divisions, are ye not carnal, and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of, of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither is he that plants anything, neither is he that waters, but God, uh, but God that gives the increase. The carnal Christian is always looking for a fight. They are willing, uh, they are willing to tear the church to pieces over silly, immature issues uh, that, come, uh, that comes to mind. Oftentimes you see this happen when you, people will destroy a church, split a church over the color of the carpet. Does the color of the carpet matter? No. But the, you know what? The carnal Christians will come in and be like, my daddy got saved on that carpet. It better stay. And they'll sit there and throw all kinds of stuff. You know, at your way. Oh, you can't do it. It's too expensive. It's just fine. Just because it smells, it's okay. I mean, whatever. It is. I'm not saying that about this carpet because this carpet is, you know, is good. But I'm just saying in general, this is the kind of stuff they'll bring up. They'll bring up, they'll bring up all kinds of petty things about, you know, about the, how the church is not being run right or however it is. They are easily offended and they are quick to defend the rights that they have never earned for themselves. This type of person, person is to be watched very, very carefully. Because all they're going to do is come in here. I'm not saying that a person that is a carnal Christian cannot become a spiritual Christian, uh, you know, uh, the, the spirit man. They can. But the thing is, is that they have to get past all this other stuff. That's why I say, you know what, when you're newly saved, stay in that spiritual man. I'll tell you that right now. Because it's, for some, it's, gonna, it's hard to get out of that carnality. There are many, many uh, uh, carnal Christians in churches uh, today. If you are one... Please let me remind you that Jesus did not save you to stagnate. Jesus didn't, you know, uh, uh, die for you upon that cross just so you can sit there and begin to smell and get a little moldy. That's what stagnate uh, means, uh, doesn't it? Everybody knows, you know, what a stagnant, you know, uh, what a swamp is. It's a what? It's a stagnant body of water. As Doc said, it stinks. He saved you to serve him and to grow. Today, uh, you know, just so you know, today would be a very good time to throw off all those works of the flesh, the old carnal attitudes, the laziness, and whatever it is that has caused you to become carnal and get right with the Lord. Whatever is causing you, whatever, you, uh, whatever excuses you've been using or anything else, today would be a great day to get right with the Lord. And the reason why I say, you know what, it's hard for a carnal Christian, you know, uh, to, to become that spiritual man is because they allow Satan to come back and Satan will come back and say, you know what, that didn't happen. You know, you, you said you got, you know, you got right with the Lord, but didn't you just do this? And didn't you just do that? Or God didn't really, God didn't really, you know, take care of that when you, when you asked him to get rid of your laziness. I mean, he will get you to either try to be legalistic or lazy. Now, those are the two. Legalistic meaning this. Well, I was only using the bathroom for you know, four minutes and 37 seconds. I mean, I didn't think that that was really lazy. I mean, you, 
A person can get down to that fact where they say, you know what, uh, I wasn't trying to be lazy. I just used the restroom for that amount of time. I just, I just went to the bathroom for, I mean, I was trying to read God's word. On, I mean, and a person will get so high strung on being legalistic. Or the lazy part would be the fact of that you're that night owl. You had time, you know, maybe in the morning to do it, but then you say, you know, I'm just going to stay, and you stay up until 1, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm too old for that. I can't do that anymore. <laughs> but what type of person are you? I, if you're a, the natural person, I pray that you get saved this morning. I pray that something that, you know, was spoken this morning, that God has spoken to you, you say, you know what, I want to get saved. I thank the Lord for the four that already did. Join them. If you're a spiritual person, pray for those who are carnal. And you know what, and continue on uh, what you've been doing. Don't let somebody come up to you and try and bring, uh, have, have you come down to their level. You bring them up and say, you know what, I'm up here, come on up here with me. Or you're that carnal Christian, you know it, and right now you're going, man, pastor, it's 1216. Aren't you supposed to be done at 1215? No, I want you to get right with the Lord. I want you to leave that carnality behind and, and, and begin to grow in the Lord, to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. Do you know the reason why oftentimes that churches you know, seem like they're only run by a few people? It's because there's a lot of carnal Christians in the church. And you only see them every so often. Don't be like that. I'm not telling you to come over here and you got to paint the church or you got to do whatever. I'm just saying, you know what, get involved. Some people say, you know what, you know, you know I know that I don't show up to church. I only show up to church once every you know, month, once every two months. But nobody even cared the fact that I was in the hospital. Or nobody, you know, even called me up. It's because they don't know you. Right? And I'm not saying that's an excuse for you know, people to like all of a sudden forget, but we do forget. But, you know, oftentimes we remember people that we know. Like when you know, uh, people are, are gone, like I know, you know, uh, I, I know that certain you know, you know, people like, that are here all the time, and when they're gone, I go, where are they at? Because they, they've been here. They, they've, they've been around those things. This morning, over the next few moments, and I hopefully this entire, uh, this entire service, you found out, you know exactly where you're at. You know that either you're a natural person, and I say get saved. If you're a spiritual person, keep growing. And if you're carnal, repent. Come, uh, come, uh, come down to the Lord and ask him to forgive you. So over the next few moments, I want you to begin to evaluate and say, you know what? If you are carnal, I want you to you know, say, I want to be spiritual. I want to get to that point. And I'm going to keep on pushing forward until, you know, until it becomes a habit of those things. Because you got into the habit of being carnal because of the fact that it became a habit. You can change that habit and become spiritual by the things that you choose to do and don't do that uh, throughout the day.